Welcome to Askew, I'm Phil Taggart. This edition of Askew features the Fresno Poets. In 1958, Philip Levine came to teach at Fresno State College. Levine, along with Peter Evervine, Charles Hanflicek, Robert Mezzi, Corrine Hales, Juan Felipe Herrera, and others, then mentored and nurtured a generation of writers who have helped shape the world of American letters. We're going to attend an historic poetry reading at the Fresno Art Museum, and we'll talk with David Oliveira, who is also a Fresno poet and edited with Christopher Buckley and M. L. Williams, the heyday publication, How Much Earth, the Fresno Poets. On today's show, we'll hear Philip Levine, Suzanne Lemus, C. J. Hanslicek, David Dominguez, Jean Jansen, and we'll start with David St. John reading Anastasia and Sandman by the late Larry Levis. The last time I was on this stage, was to read with my friend Larry Levis. And um, he was my closest friend for almost 30 years. David Oliveira asked me to read this poem. It's a long poem, so take a deep breath. It's called Anastasia and Sandman. the brow of a horse, in that moment when the horse is drinking water so deeply from a trough, it seems to inhale the water is holy. I refuse to explain. When the horse had gone, the water in the trough, all through the empty summer went on reflecting clouds and stars the horse cropping grass in a field, and the fly buzzing around its eyes are more real than the mist in one corner of the field or the angel hidden in the mist, for that matter. Members of the Committee on the Ineffable, let me illustrate this with a story and ask you all to rest your heads on the table, cushioned if you wish in your hands, and if you want comforted by a small carton of milk to drink from, as you once did long ago, when there was only a curriculum of beach grass, when the University of Flies was only a distant humming. In Romania, after the war, Stalin confiscated the horses that had been used to work the fields. You won't need horses now, Stalin said, cupping his hand to his ear. Can't you hear the tractors coming in the distance? I hear them already. The crowd in the Calais of Victoria listened closely, but no one heard anything. In the distance, there was only the faint glow of a few clouds, and the horses were led into boxcars and emerged as the dimly remembered meals of flesh that, led the starving, that fed the starving poles during that famine and part of the next one, in which even words grew thin and transparent, like the pale wings of ants that flew out of the oldest houses, and slowly, what had been real in words began to be replaced by what was not real, by the not exactly real. Well, not exactly, but became the preferred administrative phrasing so that the man standing with his hat in his hands would not guess that the phrasing of a few words had already swept the earth from beneath his feet. That horse I had, he was more real than any angel. The house fly, when I had a house, was real too, is what the man thought. Yet it wasn't more than a few months before the man began to wonder, talking to himself out loud before the others, was the horse real? Was the house real? 
An angel flew in and out of the high window in the factory where the man worked, his hands numb with cold. He hated the window and the light entering the window, and he hated the angel, because the angel could not be carved into meat or dumped into the ossuary and become part of the landfill at the edge of town. It therefore could not acquire a soul and resembled in significance nothing more than a light summer dress when the body has gone. The man survived because after a while he shut up about it. Stalin had a deep understanding of the kulaks, their sense of marginalization and belief in the land. That is why he killed them all. Members of the Committee on Solitude consider our own impoverishment and the progress of that famine in which now it is becoming impossible to feel anything when we contemplate the burial alive in a two-hour period of hundreds of people who were not clichés, who did not know they would be the illegible blank of the past that lives in each of us, even in some guy watering his lawn on a summer night. Consider the death of Stalin and the slow, uninterrupted evolution of the horse, a species no one, not even Stalin, could extinguish, almost as if what could not be altered were something noble in the look of its face, something incapable of treachery. Then imagine, in your planning proposals, the exact moment in the future when an angel might alight and crawl like a fly into the ear of a horse and then eventually into the brain of a horse and imagine further that the angel in the brain of this horse is, for the horse cropping grass in the field, largely irrelevant, a mist in the corner of the field, something that disappears, the horse thinks, when weight is passed through it, something that will not even carry the weight of its own father on its back, the horse decides, and so demonstrates this by swishing at a fly with its tail, by continuing to graze as the dust comes on and almost until it is night. Old contrivers, daydreamers, walking chemistry sets, exhausted chimney sweeps of the spaces between words where the holy ghost tastes just like the dust it is made of. Let's tear up our lecture notes and throw them out the window. Let's do it right now, before wisdom descends upon us like a spider web over a burned out theater marquee, because what's the use? I keep going to meetings where no one's there, and contributing to the discussion. <laughs> and besides, behind the angel hissing in its mist is a gate that leads only into another field, another outcropping of stones and withered grass, where a horse named Sandman and a horse named Anastasia used to stand at the fence and watch the traffic pass, where there were outdoor concerts once, in summer, under the missing and innumerable stars. When I, well, anyway, when I got to Fresno State, there was a, a class I was, I needed a, an English class, there was a class called Poetry Writing. 
and it was taught by Philip Levine, although I didn't know who he was. I didn't know when that was there to tell me. And he wasn't famous then, except in the English circles. Um, he had had only one book that had come out uh, several years before from a small press. Uh, he was a great teacher. Uh, it's hard to explain why he was such a great teacher, but uh, I knew after that experience that this was the best teacher I'd, I'd ever had. I learned um, so much about poetry, about how to appreciate poetry, how to tell if something was good from something that wasn't good. And he did this uh, with lots of humor. I mean, every class was uh, an entertainment. Um, I also was in a, uh, a class that included uh, Larry Levis. It was his last class with Levine at Fresno State. And uh, other people, uh, Bruce Boston, um, Greg Pape was there. Uh, Omar Salinas came in and out of class. And uh, these people were already wonderful poets. The things I was writing were silly and uh, and uh, the, uh, easily <laughs> easy to criticize. Uh, how, how Levine would teach is that we would turn in poems to him uh, each week, take it to his office, and his secretary would type them up and mimeograph them. You know, that's how we did things in the 1967. And, and uh, uh, at, at, during class, uh, we would receive a packet that had all of the poems that had been turned in during the week. Then, uh, then Phil would sit in front of a class at, at a desk, and he would talk about um, one of the poems. He would start at the beginning and uh, read the poem first. And he, he read it as if it, had, it was his poem. So his, his voice you know, is, is just a wonderful voice for poetry. When he finished reading, Everything sounded like it was made out of gold. And then he would start talking about it. Sometimes he would look at the back side of the piece of paper and see that it was blank and say, you know, this is the best part of this poem. He was, you know, he was hypercritical, but n not in a way that was cruel and in a way that constantly guided you toward what was good. He wanted you to be as good as he was. He didn't want you to write just good poetry. He wanted you to write the best poetry. And that's what he instilled in us, in, in um, all of us, I think. Uh, we all came away, all of us feeling the same way, even now when we get together and talk about it. We all still have that same, that same passion. I'm going to read a poem by a remarkable woman who was one of my best students and certainly one of the most remarkable women Fresno has given us. Shirley Williams. It's called The Wish On Line. The end of a line is movement. The process of getting on, getting off, of moving right along. The dark corridors of the hospital swallowed him up. Moving right along now from distant sanatorium to local health care unit. The end of that line is song. TB is killing me. We traveled some to see Daddy on that old Wishon route, but the dusty grave swallowed him up. These are the buses of the century, running through the old wealth of the town, Huntington Park, Van Ness Extension, the way stops of servants, rest after miles of walking and working, cotton working, grapes, working hay. The end of this line is the county, county hospital, county welfare, county home, moving right on. No one died of TB in the 50s. No one rides that line for free. Dear homeboy, there's a stealthy sort of leopard-like knocking at my door tonight, I half wish were you. But the sky's grainy violet, and no one's out there loitering darkly like a dent. Know what's going down? 
Total eclipse of the moon, kid, it's pretty dim out. Just the gas station's block of light, like the landmark at the world's end. Jump off here. If you were there, you'd use it to check out your reflection in the hood of someone's car. You'd use the neighbor's zinnias to wipe the street life off your feet. You'd use your condition as an alibi. It couldn't have been me, man. I'm like dead. You'd consider knocking, take on that shrewd look you always got to hide a mind just half made up, one hand idly questioning the spot around your ribs where blood streaked out onto the asphalt and turned black, looked black in the liquor store blur and bulb of ambulance. Look up, a tablet dissolving in blue mist or mauve. The moon's half gone. I know the feeling, sure. And you, you're gone more. Well, there had been uh, uh, two Fresno anthologies in the past, one in 1970 called the Down at the Santa Fe Depot. And it was a remarkable anthology. Uh, it was just a, a, a confluence of wonderful circumstances. David Curdian and uh, uh, Jimmy Bloyan were the editors. Uh, David Curdian um, pub was a publisher. Uh, he had his own press. and. Um, Jimmy Bloyan knew all of the, uh, the poets at Fresno State. And so they, uh, you know, they got together and created this anthology. It, it turned out later that you know, half of the people in the anthology went on to national reputations. So it was just you know, circumstance and, and uh, uh, good luck. Then the next anthology came out in uh, 1984. 1987, uh, called uh, Piecework. And it included the next, basically the next generation. Uh, Levine was included again, Charles Hanzlicek was included again. But basically it was another generation of uh, poets. And uh, many of these poets also went on to big reputations. Uh, David St. John and uh, uh, Gene Jansen, uh, Dixie Salazar, John Weinberg. Uh, it's just uh, amazing that there would be so much poetry coming from the valley. Well, so a number of years had passed, and um, um, there was now a new generation, and plus the old books had been long out of print. And uh, I wanted to have a new anthology. One the selfish reason was I wanted to be in it. Uh, I, f I asked my friend Marty, Williams, who uh, was a f graduate of Fresno and from a, the m much later generation than me, um, if he would uh, help me, and he said he would. And then we asked Chris Buckley, another friend, and uh, he agreed to help. And the three of us made a, a wonderful team. We really worked as a, as a team and uh, pulled it together. After I graduated from the University of California at Irvine with a, a degree in comparative literature, I came back home and worked in a sausage factory. We, we spent a lot of time sitting on the curb and staring at the 99, saying to ourselves, I'd rather be there going someplace else, until the factories rose up around us and we couldn't see the freeway any longer. Highway 99. One evening, for a fresh carton of Marcoli German sausage and for a silver thermos filled with bitter black coffee, the crane operator agreed to lift Guillermo high above the cracked asphalt of 6th Street, high above Roding Park, high above the water towers, high above even Marcoli sausage. Guillermo shed his bloody apron, his cotton smock, his hairnet, dropped his green hard hat on the concrete slab, and stepped onto a small plywood platform he and the operator rigged, gave a solid two thumbs up, 
and grabbed the thick cable of the crane. The crane operator pulled down carefully two tight green knob levers, and I watched Guillermo lift off the ground and sway in the breeze. When I was six years old, I once climbed the Magnolia because on Christopher Columbus Day, the teacher said, the world is round. A confident declaration that found no home in my logic, for even from the tall magnolia, the world looked flat as my hand. I scoured the city, longed for the earth's arc, and after the dark tide of the dark night rose and then fell, I continued the search because the stars guided wise men home. But while under the spell of the August evening, I discovered not the world's edge, nor the terror of a thinly branched treetop bending side to side like the masthead of a pilgrim ship. From the top of the magnolia, high as telephone poles along Sherman Street, amid the city yearning for land, I spotted the dark walls of Foodland Market, Red Heart Pharmacy, and Beverly's Fabric Shop. The places I hated most, I then knew, loomed only two blocks from my bedroom window. I declared myself captain of a boat, a captain fit for a gold compass, the part scrolls, and fit for the starboard side view of the evening earth when the blue water slept and the magnolia blooms filled my palms with the scent of lemons. It was the end of an overtime shift that dragged meat heavy into Friday evening and the darkness that hides the dead. The dark reeked of blood and buried the men who filled their hearts with thoughts of extra pay, never worth an hour of the work. And the men sat slumped in their small cars, and their dark heads were hung low, and their groaning was dark, and their tired, sour breath stank of the dark. Guillermo, high in the air as the giant boom could reach, the white of his eyes alongside the white emerging moon, standing on the platform and scouring the city, holding his arms out like wings to balance his weight in the wind, his mouth locked agape, and his whole torso bobbing up and down. Guillermo, possessed by the force of creation, pointed at the sunset glowing down the highway, a cement spine that left industrial Fresno and throbbed with life. My poem is entitled, Broken Places. We know that the mountains can't heal us, even as they stand beside us, serene after their own great upheaval. And from the deep, the hidden springs rise. For my irregular heart, my father said, soaking in the sulfurous pool, the rain sizzling around him. On the other side of the world, Mitsuko and I strip and scrub then enter the tranquil heat. Like sisters, no need to speak, for the water has claimed us, holding us above the rush of the river. All of us shipwrecked, clutching what we can, no cure except the final one. But here for a while, our bodies release the secret aches, holding nothing but water in our arms, we lean against the split and tumbled sides of rocks, here where the mountain's heart spills out, holding us in its own broken place, the mists rising. I was going to read my terribly depressing poem on turning 55, but then I decided to pity you <laughs> and read instead a poem called Egg. I'm scrambling an egg for my daughter. Why are you always whistling, she asks. Because I'm happy. And it's true, though it stuns me to say it aloud. There was a time when I wouldn't have seen it as my future. It's partly a matter of who is there to eat the egg. The self fallen out of love with itself through the tedium of familiarity or this little self, so curious, so hungry, who emerged from the woman I love, a woman who loves me in a way I've come to think I deserve now that it arrives from outside me. Everything changes, we're told, and now the changes are everywhere. 
the house with its morning light that fills me like a revelation, the yard with its trees that cast a bit more shade each summer, the love of a woman that both is and isn't confounding, and the love of this clamor of questions at my waist. Clamor of questions, you clamor of answers, here's your egg. It's called Red is Always Twilight. Sitting again hours at a stretch while my brother squints, jabbing at the canvas where my face begins to sprout in shades of persimmon and milk. I'd like to know how I first awakened in his mind before the lines arrived to arrange themselves. The sliding door is open and outside sun flecks a pair of wooden chairs slathered in whitewash. This afternoon, I listened absently to the faint plosives of rain opening on the rooftop, his brush scratching dry muslin, as he explained his theory of color. Myself, I think red is always twilight, embers that crumble, winter coming on in black silhouettes. Or I will look at yellow and still sometimes see Stefan's hair, bright reedy clumps that came away in his mother's hand when she'd pet him, 13, brain mushrooming tumors the size of thumbs, pushing his eyes, finally blind. I remembered he'd fight sleep unless the drapes were open and his box of sky there. Boys, we three talked of lights in his forehead then as glass tubes of an old radio that pulsed and crackled faintly until they sipped a whole darkness. After that, my brother never had a friend, and I have felt a certain swift and painful shyness overcome me when I love another creature. I suppose blue is just the hard mothering of atmosphere and light falling into every day without question. It's out there now, behind the peak of the house, behind my brother's head, swirling with the clatter of pigeons, circling there in the coming dusk, the one fat palm that fronts the property. I'd want the true plum green shimmer of their smooth Victorian bellies somewhere in the work I'd do if what I made were pictures. I'd paint a white star in the corner of my brother's eye, a tiny spot that pulls the full spectrum in and gives it back, the furious silent desire that's in all things before they calm and pass. Hope you enjoyed a look and listen to the Fresno Poets. And it might be a good time to pick up the Fresno Poet Anthology, How Much Earth. See you next time on Askew.